Hello, my name is Holly Tanner with the Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehab Institute, and I'm here with Don Sandalchidi, who has been a longtime faculty member, and of course, the person we all think about when we have questions about pediatric pelvic health. So hi, Don. can you tell us a little bit about the primary course that you've been teaching for such a long time, and then this, this more defined uh, or specific specialty course that you've also created? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. It's so good to see you. Uh, so the pediatric peds one, I call it, it's the pediatric pelvic floor disorders, you know, urinary incontinence, bedwetting, addresses constipation, but not into a great depth, but a good introduction to constipation in children, as well as kind of looking at the big picture of what's wrong with kids. I remember that's how I started was when I was approached by a pediatric urologist and he said, and I hate to say it this way, but he did say, and I quote, get this kid out of my office. And I'm mm. like, what's wrong with kids? And I was treating adults and, and he taught me a lot. This man was amazing. And he really taught me all the different other things that go on with children in pediatric urology, like vesicle ureteral reflux mm. and having ureteral reimplantations and, and, you know, kind of things I was really unaware of. And how does the pelvic floor relate to that? How can we help those kiddos? And of course, bedwetting is a big concern in children and, and daytime urinary leakage, you know, things like that. So we go into a lot of those basic pediatric diagnoses. And gosh, I've been doing this, practicing 40 years in May and doing pediatric pelvic floor for 29 years. And as I, you know, as this, this field has progressed, I've seen more and more GI disorders developing and more and more complicated patients. It's kind of like in adult pelvic health. You, you know, you take your first course and your basics, and then you get the most complicated patient that you haven't right. learned about yet. And so, so I kept getting these more and more complicated uh, kiddos and, um, and pediatric pelvic pain as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a wonderful journey. So I developed the next level course, PEDS2, which is the functional pediatric gastrointestinal disorders. And it's really looking beyond the pelvic floor. We learn all the basics in PEDS1, the first level on how to use biofeedback, how to use surface EMG, ultrasound can be helpful, jelly belly, so we're not, so it's less invasive for children. And just learning some of those real basic techniques and learning how to talk to children. That's the number one thing I hear is, how do you talk to kids? Mm -hmm. And so learning how to talk to children about their pelvic floor. And then I was seeing more and more children with more severe constipation and more IBS type symptoms and abdominal pain, pelvic pain. And what that turned into was, well, let's really open up the door to look at the big picture of this whole child. And I think my training I did with Diane Lee on the integrated systems model, you know, you can apply that model to anything. And I started really looking at the ribs and the diaphragm. And we know how important the diaphragm is with pelvic floor, but in children, it's really interesting. Kids with chronic constipation present with diastasis rectus abdominis or DRAs almost 80% of my kiddos. And they also have a hyperextension in the thoracic spine and the rib cage is posteriorly rotated and they don't know how to bring it down. Mm -hmm. And their DRAs are almost always above the umbilicus, but almost never below. And so I started getting really curious about the musculoskeletal disorders and why is this pressure system causing such a problem here and how we need to expand past the pelvic floor and, and look beyond and, and children that have chronic constipation or children with, that are born with anal rectal malformations like imperforate anus or Hirschsprung's disease. They have very large and distended abdomens. And, and as they're progressing and aging and learning how to potty train and learning how to manage their bowel system, we also need to manage their visceral system, their diaphragm, their rib cage, their whole musculoskeletal system. So this, the second level course is, it's my favorite course to teach if I had to pick a favorite. Mm -hmm. And I love it because it's so functional. 
And when I teach these, these techniques in this class, uh, uh, the students always say, well, I use all these on my adults. And you know, you really can translate that to your adult population. And we see it frequently. The question is, is who's the driver? Mm -hmm. and, and pediatrics, it's typically, and my patient population, it's typically a bowel issue. So we look at all the bowel issues. You know, aerophasia, things that you are not as common, but when you get a kid with this and you're like, okay, now what do I do? Right. And how do I address aerophasia in, um, in a child? And, and how do I work with descent of the pelvic floor with the diaphragm? And how do I do that with kids? So that's kind of the big picture of that course. And it's really a lot of fun. Well, and I imagine there are some things that you talk about in PEDS 1 as well that you just never have enough time to flesh out in the way that you want to. Are there some other topics that you think folks might find interesting that you just, you might get to review, but also expand upon in the PEDS 2 class? Yes. It's like I was saying earlier, you're going to get that first kiddo that you're like, okay, this is an imperforate anus, or this is a, a child who's had chronic constipation. And the children I see with chronic constipation, it's not just like I need to take a little Marilax. Mm. It's they have psychostomies. They have to have they have to have flushes when their bowel is so expanded for so long and it's so stretched. They do colostomies for bowel rest. So then those children need to learn how to have a bowel movement again mm -hmm. because they haven't had a bowel movement through the anus in one to two years. And so then I also teach rectal balloon training so we can teach the children how can they learn how to sense urge. What does it feel like when something's in the rectum? How do I empty? And how do I do that with children? And actually in the PEDS2 class, because we're adults, this is one of the classes that does lend itself well to doing online with Zoom because we're adults and when we do a, a live adult lab, we are looking at adult bodies, not pediatric bodies. And so when COVID hit, the beauty of it was I created hundreds of videos of children. And so we can actually see children doing rectal balloon training live. Um, I have videos of, of rectal balloon training and um, um, almost all, uh, well, all the techniques I teach are videos of children having the techniques performed. And I did another one tonight that was really fun with a child with pedendal neuralgia. Wow. So, I know. Can you, can, you, can you speak a little bit more about the pain piece? Because I, I, almost, I almost wonder if you're on the threshold of developing a pediatric pelvic pain course. You know, well, it's half written. <laughs> it is half written already. So we can expect that to come out in about um, two months. Wow. Um, yeah, because the pediatric pelvic pain is becoming more prevalent and we can't treat it the same as adults. Children don't understand. And pain neuroscience, so we're actually creating a pain neuroscience, like a mini pediatric pain neuroscience protocol. And it's very, it, it's a large biopsychosocial approach and we use really fun things. So this little guy, I'll just share a little story about him. I just saw him tonight and he came to me with severe testicular pain and, and nobody believed me that it could have been, that it could be pedendal neuralgia. And he was taking three Vicodin a day, oh. gabapentin and meloxicam. I, I got approval for Xanaflex, a muscle relaxant, and a rectal suppository for muscle relaxation. And he has not been in school since September. He's been in bed. Um, he's gained so much weight. He has red, bright red stretch marks all over him from being in bed and not being active. And he came in and sat there going, uh, 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 and that was just his way of expressing his pain. Wow. And he is doing an hour and 15 minutes of school a day. He's extremely intelligent, so he's actually not too far behind. Mm -hmm. And getting ready to go back to school in two weeks. Oh, he's gives me chills. He's a, I know. He's amazing. I got him hooked up with virtual reality glasses oh. because when we, in pain neuroscience, when we can distract ourselves from our pain, he is extreme. He's doing extremely 
well. I mean, he's, his movement is amazing. He has, I hooked him up with a functional nutritionist to help with the dietary. We, you know, kids in pain, parents like to feed them to give them comfort. And so that was kind of the problem and his dietary issues. So we're, you know, working through that. And let's say he went swimming for two hours last week on spring break. He went to the mall with his best buddies. First time he'd gone out with his friends, he had a birthday party. He can sit for two hours now doing board games and doing Legos with his dad. That is so tremendous. You've saved and his life, right? It really, this kid is, he's different. He, he smiles. He looks at me now. I mean, when I saw him tonight, he engaged it with me looking into my face the whole time. So stay tuned for that course. And that's really going to just be a mini, a little mini thing I'm going to do probably online later. But um, the PEDS 2 course, everything that's in the PEDS 2 course, it le you have to do all of that baseline. So PEDS 1, I, so I did biofeedback with him and I got his muscle tone down really to flat line with some animated surface EMG. He loved that. And then we got him to learn how to use his pelvic floor. And I taught him proper defecation dynamics. Because if you, you know, as, as anybody knows that treats anything in pelvic pain, if we're constipated, we're in trouble. And so managing his constipation and teaching him how to empty was really important. And then, you know, it's one thing to teach some basic breathing, but tonight I taught him how to do some vagus nerve stimulation with the, the protocol of 30 seconds, higher intensity, 60 seconds, low and he's able to walk now so he can do that. He wasn't walking when I got him more than a hundred yards, you know, just very so profound. Yeah. yeah well, you yeah. know, as I hear you talking about these different interventions that you use, I think about some of the participants who are going to be in your course here you are saying, and then there's balloon biofeedback retraining, and then there's you know, surface EMG biofeedback and pain neurosciences and visceral and medication management and all of these so valuable pieces. And I know that younger therapists or even those who've been out for five to seven years, but maybe see a few pediatric patients here and there, I think one of the things they can gain from your expertise and knowledge and skills is how and when to choose those modalities. Or I know you get this question all the time, where do you start? And I bet so many of the case histories and the stories are illustrative along those lines, right? Where you're not just teaching them skills, you're really giving examples and allowing folks to think to themselves, where would I start and what would I use? And at the end of PEDS 1, you're gonna start almost every single patient with what you're gonna learn in that course. And there's like five things, there's five basics and you do your five basics and that's the starting point for everything. And so it just builds then into level two and level two then builds into pelvic pain. So it really goes into this continuum and it's so easy and it's fun. The one thing that people, I don't want people to be concerned about rectal balloon training either. I don't want people to also to think that I use it with 90% of my patients. I probably use it with less than 10%, maybe 5% of my patients use, um, we use rectal balloon training. But if you are having that skill, having that ability to know how to do it, and my lab handouts are right, I mean, line by line, exactly what to do, what to do next, what to do next with pictures of mm -hmm. everything, because it's not something that we do so frequently that we don't all need to do a review of, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't want people to think, well, I, I'm not going to do that, because that patient's going to walk in your door and the doctor's going to say... This patient just came, um, had a colostomy takedown. Can you do rectal balloon training? And, and you're going to be like, yes, I know how to do that. <laughs> I'm going to go back to my notes. I'm going to read through those notes and I'm going to, and it, you can. So it is something that some therapists might be concerned about, but there's nothing to be concerned about. And patients that have anal rectal deformations or any type of problem that they were born with genetically, they're used to having something in their rectum all the time because that's what's happened in their lives. They're not, you're more concerned about than they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Donna, I want to 
take a moment just to say that I'm I'm so grateful for all you've contributed over the years. And you know, when I have heard perhaps some critiques of, you know, we shouldn't be teaching pelvic muscle training using just the posterior muscles. I think I I never learned that that way because I've had folks like Holly Herman, Kathy Wallace, and Don Sandalchidi all, you know, ingesting all of their clinical work and the research and feeding it back to us. And uh, that we always included the breath and looked at the trunk and incorporated deep core muscles and looked at the orthopedic structures. I feel like we've been so lucky as pelvic health clinicians that this, this lineage of shared knowledge and continued learning and exposure to, you know, work of folks like Diane Lee and Paul Hodges and all the other, you know, excellent clinicians. So there's that gratitude I want to share. And I also wonder, do you find it kind of fun to see some of the clinicians you've trained in pediatrics also really level up their skills and help spread their work in their communities? Oh my gosh. I, I actually do read the course evaluations and I you know, have a website, kidsbowelbladder.com and, and I get feedback from students and, and they're saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just started this program and I'm getting inundated and and I gotta, I gotta have more, I need more, I need more. And our pediatric Facebook group is nearly 3,000 strong right now. Fantastic. Nearly 3,000. I'm one of the administrators for that group, like you are for the global group. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm telling you, I get somewhere between eight and 20 new requests per week. It's this field is absolutely exploding. And I can tell by my courses that they're, sold out all the time. (laughs) And it's really, I I love, you know, I'm not going to be around forever, you know, so we need more people learning this. And the more people that learn it, the more kids that are getting treated. And the less adults who have pelvic dysfunction. Exactly. And we have research to support that. Mm. And I always share this story and I just want to do a disclaimer. This is, it can be upsetting. Mm-hmm. that it was about 15 years ago when I had a child at a pediatrician call me and saying that her daughter-in-law is a pediatric anesthesiologist. And um, this, this pediatrician was my kid's pediatrician. And she said, Don, this 11 year old boy hung himself because he had fecal incontinence. And I, I will not get upset about that ever. And when I repeat the story, it still upsets me. And she just said, Dawn, if this pediatrician of this family only knew what you could do with children, this kid's life could have been saved. And that's profound. And I want everybody to be having some background, some knowledge to know what to do with children. In PEDS 2, we develop, we really delve into fecal incontinence and how to manage fecal incontinence and how to learn about all the different medications that kids are given besides Miralax. Mm -hmm. So what does Miralax do and why is that better or why is it worse? And why, when do we add this? And when do we take away this? And what is the protocol and how do we do all that? And I really feel that's my life's purpose is to get information out there so kids don't suffer. Parents stop suffering because these really are special needs children. They have a special need and the parents are besides themselves. Mm -hmm. They're beside themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and when you can teach some simple things and, and, and you make huge changes in these families' lives. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Holly, is it, it translates to adulthood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly have answered your calling and I know we'll continue to share all your continued learning yourself with uh, everyone you come in contact with. So thank you so much for sharing some time with me. And I know folks are really going to get a great, great sense of what this next course is about. And I get folks to hear what you have to say. Yes. Thank you for having me. You bet. Thanks a lot, Don.